and thank you so much for joining me for another chapter of Sarah My Story. And we're up to chapter one because the first two videos was this very long preamble that took us through all the juiciest bits about the <laughs> toe sucking scandal. But now we're going back to her childhood and it, oh, I learned so many things in this chapter I didn't know. So let's just get stuck straight into it. I'll be interested to see what you think. Okay, so it's chapter one, The Pot Hunter, and she tells us about her love of horses and a few little things she says are, many other things I love about horses. They are large and safe and they never answer back. And the way they fall in line when you show them who's boss. And then she talks about how their loyalty and their consistency became a real touchstone for her. And you can see that she really did just love these creatures so much. I think they kept her grounded. They made her feel loved back. And um, it gave her a focus, a positive focus for her childhood. Now, when I read about her childhood, I, I don't like her mother. Now, you're going to hear why in this chapter, so we'll get on. Now, she grew up in a beautiful home called Lowood, which was a big white Edwardian house, only about 40 minutes drive from London. There were two horse stables on the property. It was a big property, about 14 acres. And she mentions her mother for the first time. And she says, my mother refused to baby me. When I fell, she made a joke about how silly the horse had been to step in a rut. And soon I would be laughing with her. I was a tough little monkey and I'd just clamber back on and dig in my heels. Now, that's not why I don't like a mother. <laughs> it's fine. That's fine. It's later on. It's later on. So, you know, they were on this property. She got on really well with her older sister, Jane. They were very affectionate. They played together a lot. And then she goes on to say something really interesting because I never realised that Sarah came from quite a prestigious background. I, I never knew that. I mean, she's not aristocracy, as she says in this book, but, you know, fairly impressive lineage, really. Though heavily Irish on both sides, my family tree claimed its quota of blue blood with four dukes and at least three mistresses of Charles II. My father, Major Ronald Ferguson, hailed from a long line of distinguished gentlemen soldiers. My mother, the former Susan Wright, came from an established family in Ireland. So they were country gentry, but they weren't the aristocracy and they didn't sort of have, they had a little bit of old money, as Sarah pointed out, and they led quite a comfortable life. As she said, they had a small household staff and trips to the seaside in the summer and Switzerland in the winter. Now, I never realised that Sarah grew up with a small household staff. I thought, I always thought when I read The Housekeeper's Diary that she was a bit overwhelmed with staff and that that's why she'd come across as a little bit standoffish and arrogant. I thought, you know, when someone can feel uncomfortable in a situation and they can try to cover it up by being coming across as a little arrogant, and that's what I thought. Well, that's the excuse I made for her anyway. <laughs> she was used to having staff. So I can't keep making that excuse for her. Now, in 1969, after her grandfather died of leukaemia, um, her father inherited a dairy farm called Dummer Down over the county line in Hampshire, and we moved out to the real country. Now, this house wasn't as grand as Lowood, but she found it quite perfect and she loved it because she was always outdoors there. She was always exploring and playing with Jane, as I said, and there were cows there and there were neat fields of corn, barley and oats and wheat. There was a rose garden and an apple orchard and flowers grew everywhere. And so she just had a lovely time. She was in seventh heaven pretty much. Um, so years later, I would revisit the exhilaration on a rather larger scale at Balmoral. So that outdoor life, that sort of outdoor farm life and lots of horses and all that sort of thing, it really suited Sarah. It really, really suited Sarah. I'm thinking maybe they might have been better off having Andrew and Sarah just up at Balmoral. I mean, this is pre any scandal. The, to the good people at Balmoral, I'm not trying to fob them off on you now, but um, back then she probably would have been happier and Andrew probably would have been happier and I don't think they would have maybe got into so much trouble because Andrew was very relaxed and loved being up there and she loved being up there. So maybe they could have been sort of, you know, 
the, the caretakers at Balmoral, the royal caretakers in residence at Balmoral, back prior any scandals, of course. Now, she goes on to talk about her grandfather, who actually distinguished himself as a commanding officer of the lifeguards, the Queen's Household Cavalry. And her father set out on the same track, and he had several postings in the Middle East. And when his military career stalled, Dads, I love how she calls him Dads, resigned his commission in the lifeguards. And he took up part-time work in public relations, but his real passion was polo. And it was through polo that he actually met Lord Louis Mountbatten, who of course was Prince Philip's uncle, and then through him he met Prince Philip. And so it was all through Polo, all those great connections were made. Now, I've got to say, I'll just give you the heads up, seeing I've read this book, I really like her dad. I know he's done lots of things wrong and I know that, you know, he had all those sex scandals and all that. <laughs> I really like him. I really like him, I've got to say. He just seems very loyal, very fun, very loving. And, you know, I just, I really like the guy. It's just an instinct, I guess. Um, so through Polo, getting back to the book, through Polo, um, of course, he then became Prince Charles's Polo manager. And so then that resulted in Jane and her actually having quite a lot of contact with the royal family. And I'll say that little bit. As a result, Jane and I had frequent opportunities to practice our curtsies before the royal family. They were not some remote abstraction. We considered them friends of our parents. So then she goes to say that when they would be playing, like there'd be a weekend match at Smith's Lawn in Windsor Great Park, she would sneak to the back of the stands in mid-chucker to play tag with other like-minded truants, including Prince Andrew who is just my age. And a young Andrew always got on well with my mum. When she visited Windsor Castle, he liked to play at squirting her with the hose. Well, I don't suppose she could really say much about that anyway, could she? <laughs> so then she goes on to say that she was a wild child, a real tomboy, the son her father never had. And she said, the dads raised me to get outside, get muddy, and most of all, to get on with it. So there's a lot of that sort of, you know gird your loins sort of attitude. Now, this is the bit where I, I don't really like her mother. So I won't carry on too much about it. I'll just read it to you and you can decide for yourself. They tell a story about me in my toddler days where mum, who could be quite strict about such things, oh yeah, determined that it was time I went properly to the bathroom. So potty training. Equally firm, I balked to win her point Mum grabbed a diaper and tied it around my front to the leg of the table in our playroom, adjacent to the kitchen. I was to stay there until I was ready to perform in a civilised fashion. Like, <laughs> how does that teach a child to go potty? I mean, really, how does that teach a child? It's not even in the right room, for one. They're going to deem it as a punishment. They're going to deem it as a highly unusual occurrence like it's and, and it was sensitive children it would frighten them so oh I just find that abusive sorry sorry I know judge, judging another mother is not here to defend herself but that's just how I feel so two minutes later she found me back in the kitchen grinning with victory I'd untied the diaper well good on you Sarah in this instance I'm on your side and then the mother muttered, I'll fix you this time. And she knotted the diaper at my back where I couldn't possibly get at it. And then she left her again, tied to the table. But then she saw when she looked in the door that she dragged the table with her across the floor. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so she was saying that her mother raised her to have world-class manners but submerge all emotion and her father had the strict military discipline and um, she learned to just sort of comply. She said at a very early age she learnt to comply. When I tell you off, mum would admonish me, why can't you just accept the criticism and say you're sorry and then we'll forget all about it? I so craved their affirmation, the big smile or the murmured well done that I took mum's advice straight to heart. So mid-reprimand in public or private, it made no difference 
She would instantly make amends. Okay, fine, quite right. I shouldn't have done that. Wasn't I a silly fool? And sure enough, they would stop. Life was easier that way. By the time I was nine or ten, my protests were few and far between. Now, the interesting thing is, like I said, she's not making excuses. She's not claiming she had a damaged childhood or she's not blaming her mother. She's blaming herself. So it's not like a Harry type book where he's blaming Prince Charles and he's blaming everyone except his mother, but blaming everyone. Um, She doesn't ever blame her mother. She just accepts it as like, well, I was a difficult child, so that's what mum had to do. But I'm reading it and I'm thinking, well, actually, Sarah, I think you had it quite hard. Now, sympathy for a child doesn't mean I'm excusing adult activities. Oh, that was a loud car. Far from it. So she wanted to be loved by everyone. I wanted to be the nicest, the kindest, the most clever and the most able. So, you know, she was very hard on herself if she let herself down. And then she says, so you fail and fail and fail and fail and every single time you fail and even when you think you've done well, you're setting yourself up to fail anew. And then when she gets into that sort of diatribe, I just feel a whole lot of self-pity coming out at that point. (laughs) My sympathy gets suspended. And all of a sudden, all the sympathy goes. She, she, she's going really well and she's getting my sympathy and then she does a line like that and I'm like, oh, get over yourself, Sarah. <laughs> so it's sort of like, you know, I'm having a Jekyll and Hyde reaction to this book. So I became my mother's favourite, not for who I was, but for how easily I gave in. And she, her mother would often say to Jane, why can't you be more like Sarah? So she was talking about her father's integrity and he was actually invited, well, they all were invited to join the royal family at a shooting weekend at Sandringham at the Queen's Norfolk Estate. And this was in winter. And it was a chance for dads to spend time socially with Prince Philip and other influential polo chums. And her mother always cherished riding with the Queen. But one day, dads went out to a different shoot where the company brought down 550 pheasants and partridges, every last one reared for the kill from babies. And her father came home, hung up his gun and said, that's it, I'm never doing it again. He was disgusted by it. He he just couldn't do it. Those birds were beautiful, he exclaimed. What the hell was I doing? So you see, I like this guy. I like this guy. It's got integrity. There would be no more invitations to Sandringham after that. And then she said, well, he had on flagging respectfulness towards the royal family. But, you know, I guess he was pretty much on the outer a little bit other than the polo then because he just wouldn't hunt. So he missed out on that sort of social connection. So dads also had a playful side. So he used to take them to go and see the opera or Sleeping Beauty, you know, pantomime or something, and he would pretend that they were going somewhere else and he'd walk down the street and then he'd all of a sudden swing around the opposite direction and then surprise them with tickets to a show. So he sounds quite fun. So dad's polo consumed him, end of story, and we'd be left with mum. And here again she praises her mother who was simply the most brilliant, zestful person I've ever met. She'd grown up herself just after World War II when it was hard to go anywhere and now she was making up for lost time. So it was her mum that organised all the ski trips abroad and the family Christmases and the birthday parties and like I said, she just absolutely adored her. And when Jane and I would invite one friend on any of their adventures that they would go on, Mum would be the fifth girl with her liquid laugh and mischievous gleam. She was the most popular mother in Hampshire, the type your friends would praise as super cool. Mum just made everything happen. So I guess who am I to judge? I mean, she clearly just absolutely adored the woman, just really did. So, yes, don't listen to me. Listen to Sarah. Okay, we'll keep going. 
So shortly after they moved to Dummer, Mum and I went out to inspect a striking chestnut Welsh cross for me to ride in competition. Now, Sarah hopped on this horse for a test drive and it was a very frisky horse and her mother was really cautious about it. And evidently, I don't know horse terms, but the little horse napped at a jump and shied back and reared up and um, tried to sort of get rid of Sarah off its back. And she said that she gave him a swift one with a stick down its rib cage. We turned and rang back at the fence and I told him he'd better jump it and he leapt it like a stag and he never napped with me again. So I don't know, you know, I, like I said, I'm not a rider. So um, that either indicates that she's a marvellous horsewoman or not. I don't know. <laughs> Now, she called him Herbie or Herbert, and Herbert was my true friend, and I secretly enjoyed it when he acted up with another rider because she tamed him. So that was a point of pride for her that she tamed him and he wouldn't muck around with her because maybe he was scared of her. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. After I turned 11, I began working with a second horse for show jumping where the fences are higher and the competition more democratic. And so she moved on to Spider, who was strong and thick, black and muscular. And when he shaved his mane, he would look like a Roman war horse. And she said a very moving thing. So I'll just read you out this little bit. It was not difficult for me to love my horses. I talked to Spider all the time. I would sit in his box with him and treat him to carrots and Spider would never disappoint me in the ring. So willing was Spider that I frequently worried he might try to clear a fence too big for him and at the Hampshire Horseshoe that year the rain fell in sheets. My trainer, Dick Stilwell, asked me if I still wanted to try. The grass was slick, but I was a pot hunter, so that's the trophy, and I was gunning for the trophy, and I replied, yes, of course, good old gung-ho slapper on the back, Fergie, wasn't about to be defeated by the weather. But see, that's when I would consider the horse, <laughs> because he could slip, and he did. Spider's feet began slipping from under him as he reached the fence and then he jumped because he was obeying his rider and he slid out of control and as he took off he crashed into the fence and he actually fell on top of Sarah. Now luckily, luckily the horse was okay. The horse was uninjured. He was fine. He didn't need any veterinary care but Sarah was very, very damaged. She was actually knocked out cold with a major concussion. She spent two days in bed, which she said felt like a jail sentence to her. And she said to finish off that little bit, um, but that was how I lived my life from childhood on, setting clear goals, taking high risks. I strive to be perfect, to make every round clear. So she's always trying to impress, isn't she? She's always trying to impress her mother, particularly, and her father, and maybe making quite foolhardy decisions, um, just seeking attention and affirmation and validation all the time. Listen to me, I sound like a psychiatrist, but it's clear, isn't it? It's like it's really clear. You don't have to be a, a shrink <laughs> to work it out that what she was like as a child. So we'll continue on. Um, I was fiercely competitive, but not a bad loser. Mum taught me that from the start, I'd find solace in a bag of crisps and a can of Coke. Oh, highly fattening, highly fattening, Sarah. My high watermark came when I qualified in working hunter pony for Peterborough, a British championship. Now, that's a really big deal. That is a really big deal. And the whole family was really excited about it. And dad's got a new horse float, which he'd fitted out so that they could actually sleep in it like a caravan when they went to this big horseshoe show. And it was in about two weeks time. Well, she was out playing with her sister Jane and they were playing bicycle tag and she would have to wait and, and count to 10 and then hoot off and try to find Jane around this property. Well, she went barreling around a corner and straight into some barbed wire fencing that had been put up to keep the cows in and it sliced her to ribbons right across her chest. Um, so I walked my little bike down the hill, the blood seeping through my shirt. I went into the study. My mother was chatting away on the phone. Mum, I think I've cut myself. 
was the understatement of the year, poor little kid. Mum turned around and told her friend she would call back and as if nothing was amiss said, OK, we'd better go to the doctor now. She's very calm, isn't she, her mum? I was taken by her calm, which is a good reaction. I know, very good reaction. That's good. I got in the car on Dad's knee, holding onto his thumb, and I nearly broke it on the way when the pain started to come through. Oh, no, I could just imagine that. I couldn't ride a Peterborough, which crushed me. I'd been so proud and mum and dads and Jane were all coming to watch. And so, of course, due to this accident, they all couldn't go. It was all cancelled, all off. And she said, I failed us all again, which, oh, that's sad, isn't it? Worse yet, my poor 12-year-old's chest had been gashed to smithereens. I still have the scars. By the following year, I'd outgrown gay little Herbert and we sold him for three times what we paid. We could not afford to keep him. Oh, that's tough on her. I hated our parting. He was my friend, you see, and I had a few enough of those. Oh, that's sad. Oh, she's had a rough trot in this first chapter. I've got to say, she has. What I remember the clearest was sitting on my dad's knee, squeezing his thumb for all it's worth and wondering whether life would ever be right again. Now, here is a really poignant ending to chapter one. It was one of the last times I would see mum and dads together. So that's the end of chapter one. And next Monday, we will go on to chapter two, Green Socks and Mockery. And this was actually when her mum met Hector Barentes. And we all know what happened there. So that would be a very exciting chapter. So let me know what you think. Do you have sympathy for Sarah the child, the Sarah 10, 11, 12-year-old? I'm not talking about the adult. I'm not talking about the future transgressions, just the child. We can pick on her later, you know, when she's... <laughs> Which is an adult. Anyway, let me know what you think. I'll be really interesting to read it. And I'll see you again, like I said, for another chapter next Monday evening. Bye.